And now for one of the more controversial of the Byzantine emperors, John I Zemiskis. Let's get the obvious out of the way. Zemiskis is best known for dramatically murdering his uncle and assuming power. This murder was committed in cold blood, and it is rather hard to overlook. That being said, Zemiskis went on to have a very successful five-year run of his own, and he did a great deal both before he came to power and after to advance Byzantine arms and the stability of the empire. It's really hard to gauge this man, however, and the runtime of this video should be a solid testament to that, especially when you consider that we actually don't know all that much about him when compared with, say, Nicephorus II, or much less, someone like Basil II. I think it's safe to say, however, that Zemiskis was one of the best emperors, even if he is not quite in that truly elite upper tier, and in his short five or so years on the throne, he came into power so late in 969 and died so early in 976 that I think we can really only count 970 to 975 as the years in which he meaningfully controlled the empire. During that short span of time, he still was able to make a major impact on the course of history, and had he lived and reigned a few more years, I think that his legacy would be far more solid. But, as always with emperors, we should begin at the beginning and look at his early life and all of the connections that he inherited, which later enabled him to become so very successful. We'll also be looking at his personality traits, which I think were absolutely key to his success, his military skills and accomplishments, and all of the other actions that he took in his lifetime. So, sit down, grab a beer, and let's talk about Zemiskis. John Zemiskis was born in 925, and unless he had actually been born into the purple, it is very difficult to imagine him being born into more favorable circumstances. He was from the creme de la creme of the Anatolian military aristocracy on both sides of his family. On his father's side, he was the great nephew of the great John Kirkawas. Around the time of his birth, John Kirkawas was still considered to be the greatest generational talent in the Byzantine world. He had really made himself into a legend of Byzantine history, and a lot of that prestige would then fall upon a young John Zemiskis. On the other hand, his mother's family was no less distinguished. His great-grandfather had been Nicephorus Phocas the Elder, the general who had distinguished himself greatly in Italy. His grandfather Bardas Phocas was not nearly as great of a general as Nicephorus had been, however he was a fairly crafty politician who had made a friendship with Constantine VII. Constantine VII at this time was still living under the thumb of the usurper Romanus I, so this was something of an investment. However, this investment in Constantine VII would pay off by around 944-945, just in time to benefit John Zemiskis perfectly. But let's be clear, even if Bardas had never risen to the position of Domesticus of the East, Zemiskis could have claimed a high command at some point in his life just due to his paternal heritage. Likewise, had Kirkawas fallen into disgrace, it is possible that Zemiskis could have then sided with the Focades and still been able to achieve a high command. He was in a position where him not rising to some level of greatness was almost inconceivable, and this is even if he were to display a complete and total lack of talent. He was at the nexus of the Byzantine uh, military aristocracy. He was connected with everyone in that world who mattered. And again, it is nearly impossible to imagine him either being better connected or that he wouldn't be given ample opportunities to prove himself whether he deserved them or not. However, as we'll see, Zemiskis was quite an able man and he proved himself worthy of the opportunities that he received. Despite the fact that he was such a high-born nobleman and that his family is so famous on both sides, we actually know nothing about Zemiskis' father. We also don't know what the meaning of the surname Zemiskis is. It could refer to some place in the Armenian world, 
or it could be linguistically related to the Armenian words for red boot or for short. We know that Zemiskis was relatively short in stature, so it may be a reference to his height or perhaps the height of some ancestor who gave the family its name. By the time that his grandfather Bardos Fokas retired around 955 or so, Zemiskis had about 10 years of military service under his belt and he was considered sufficiently senior for his uncle Nicephorus to then entrust him with high command in his own right. So by the relatively young age of about 30, Zemiskis was now in a position to claim glory and live up to the names John Kirkawas and Nicephorus Phokas. When it came time for a young John Zemiskis to get married, he found an opportunity to entrench himself even deeper within the Byzantine military aristocracy. Zemiskis married Maria Sclerina, the daughter of Pantherius Sclerus, who was the leader of the powerful Sclerus family, yet another very well connected part of the Anatolian military aristocracy. The well connected become yet more well connected just by virtue of existing. Leo the Deacon tells us that Maria was both beautiful and wise, so she must have been a great partner for Zemiskis, who of course was an ambitious man who had some major worldly concerns. While the marriage was presumably rather happy, it ultimately was unsuccessful because Zemiskis did not produce an heir with Maria, and it seems that she died without them having conceived a son and heir for Zemiskis himself. We don't know exactly when they were married or exactly when Maria died, but we do know that by 969 Maria was dead and a now 40-something Zemiskis was still without issue. Maria's brother Bardos Sclerus was later Zemiskis' most important political ally while he was on the throne. So while the marriage ended up not being technically successful, it was politically very successful and created a lifelong friendship between Bardas Sclerus and the future emperor, John Zemiskis. Both Zemiskis' connections and military talent were major factors in his success. The way that they would contribute to his eventual rise to power is no mystery and needn't be explored too much further. There is an X factor, however, which put Zemiskis above the competition, and that was his winning personality. Unlike his uncle Nicephorus II, the people who knew and interacted with Zemiskis seemed to have by and large come away with a very positive impression. We don't really have any personal abuse directed at him recorded in any of our sources. Zemiskis is universally described as being on the short side, but handsome and well-built. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. It seems that women almost universally found Zemiskis to be an attractive man, and when they would offer their bodies to him, he would almost always accept. Unlike his uncle Nicephorus, who was deeply ascetic, Zemiskis was the exact opposite. While he was not what we might call a party boy, he certainly could appreciate the finer things in life, and he enjoyed mistresses and wine when he could. The exact extent to which he indulged in these things is unclear, but because of the stark contrast with his uncle, who was more or less a warrior monk, we see Zemiskis as someone who was fairly lighthearted. However, it was this very willingness to engage in the pleasures of life, which ultimately made Zemiskis a much more talented ruler than his uncle. Nicephorus could be very off-putting, and as we have seen and will see again, this had a lot to do with why he ended up losing his throne. Zemiskis, on the other hand, could be fun. He had a sense of humor. He could get along with people. People enjoyed being around him. Women wanted to sleep with him and wanted to be his friend. Uh, those are not things you could say about Nicephorus II Phokas, whatever else you may be able to say about him as a general. Simply put, Zemiskis had a talent that his uncle did not have, and that was the talent for politics. 
Sometimes when we look back at ancient and medieval rulers, we forget that they can't just claim to be the instrument of God or claim birthright. They actually have to interact with, lead, and inspire the people around them to gain and retain their positions. Zemiskis had the skill set required to be emperor, whereas his uncle Nicephorus did not. Under the new Domesticus of the East, Nicephorus Phocas, the order of the day was for coordinated assaults from multiple armies in order to outmaneuver and overwhelm Saif al Dalla and his emirate of Aleppo. The idea is that if you have three different armies operating at once, Saif might be able to muster enough men to counter two of your armies, but the third one would be able to act unmolested. Zemiskis was entrusted with one of these three armies, the other two being commanded respectively by Leo, Nicephorus' younger brother, and Nicephorus himself. During this um, phase of the operation, and actually throughout the period of the cooperation between the three Focades, Zemiskis was usually entrusted with the command furthest to the east, and that means that although he was the youngest and least experienced, he was being entrusted with potentially the most dangerous command as he was something like the dangling flank of the Byzantine forces. In 956, Zemiskis was planning to assault the city of Amida when Saif al Dalla drew him away by launching an invasion of Byzantine territory. Rather than pressing the siege at Amida, Zemiskis decided that the wisest course of action was to pursue Saif and try to cut him off in Byzantine lands, perhaps winning a decisive battle. So, rather than fully pursuing him, however, Zemiskis decided to settle down into an ambush. This is an idea which seems to have really been perfected by Leo Phocas, who pulled this off on a couple of different occasions, one before and one after this incident. Zemiskis, however, seems to have been a little less talented when it came to the ambush, either that or Saif had some forewarning. Saif managed to spring the ambush and break through, inflicting about 4,000 casualties on Zemiskis' army and seemingly wrecking it for the rest of the 956-57 campaigning season. To make up for their nephew's failure, Nicephorus and Leo marched in and managed to rectify the situation with their own armies, winning a few victories. And with Saif being worn down now after continuous pressure, Zemiskis was able to get his army back together, and he was in a good position to resume the offensive in 958. We can get a good sense for just how effective Nicephorus' grand strategy of using the three coordinated armies was by the fact that Zemiskis' 958 campaign will take place in northern Mesopotamia. In theory, the placement of the emirate at Aleppo, which was formally authorized by the Abbasid Caliphate, was to contain the Byzantines on the northern side of the Taurus Mountains and prevent them from penetrating into the heartland of the Islamic world. However, the strategy was clearly failing, even with Saif still in power and still able to wield fairly considerable armies. This is also a pretty good indication of just how deeply decayed the Abbasid Caliphate had already become at this not all that late date. At any rate, in the spring of 958, Zemiskis would invade northern Mesopotamia, and it appears this move may have been somewhat unanticipated as he was able to capture the important fortress at Dara without meeting too much resistance. Dara had been strategically important for centuries back when Rome and the Sasanian Persians had shared a frontier in Mesopotamia. They had exchanged it many times, just like the city of Amida. Zemiskis was then challenged by Saif's general Nadja, who brought 10,000 men from Syria in order to repel the invasion of Zemiskis and hopefully retake Dara. The two forces crashed near Amida, and here Zemiskis was able to inflict a heavy defeat upon Nadja, destroying about half or so of his army, and thus rendering it incapable of further fighting. Nadja presumably had to retreat to Syria. As for Zemiskis, his campaign was just getting started. He received heavy reinforcements from Basil Lacopinus and then moved north against the city of Semisada. Perhaps his whole invasion of northern Mesopotamia was just to distract from his real intention. Semisada was a little closer to hand 
and more important at the moment. So far, it looked like the Aleppans were not going to try their luck again against this skilled general. Perhaps they thought that Semisada was a strong enough stronghold to hold out against even a Byzantine army with as many men as the Miskis and Lycopinus clearly had. In 958, the same year that he had invaded northern Mesopotamia, defeated Naja, and captured Dara, Zemiskis then doubled back and made for Samosata. This is a strategically located city in southeastern Anatolia, which is along the banks of the northern Euphrates. This city had been a major target of Byzantine strategic interest since at least 859 when the first attempt to take it was made. Since then, Byzantine arms had been steadily gaining ground, and at this point, Byzantine reach had actually exceeded Samosata, but the city still remained a Muslim stronghold. That was a situation which was bound to change, at least if Nicephorus and his generals had anything to say about it. It was, of course, the Miskis who captured the city, and this seems to have been the victory which really made him politically significant. His other victories were still rather impressive, but by no means legendary. The capture of Samosata, however, represented an actual advancement of the frontier and a gain that the empire had been seeking for a very long time. The combination of the fall of Samosata, which was something of a thorn in the side of further Byzantine expansion, combined with Samiski's proven ability to penetrate and operate in the area known as Al Jazeera, that being the combination of northern Syria, uh, northern Mesopotamia, a little bit of southern Turkey, was enough to convince Saif that the real threat among the armies was the somewhat dangling Zemiskis. So he decided to give his personal attention to the young general. The capture of Samosata was a done deal by the time that Saif arrived on the scene. In fact, Zemiskis had already moved on and captured the fortress of Raban. It was at that point that Saif challenged him to an open battle, and young Zemiskis was eager for a chance at revenge against the man who had beaten him a few years earlier. They fought a hard-fought, pitched battle where Saif's poet cousin Abu Faras was supposedly responsible for breaking two lances during the first charge the fighting was so vigorous. In the end, however, Zemiskis and his Byzantine forces emerged victorious and managed to inflict some rather damaging losses on Saif's army. Many of Saif's inner circle, his court companions, were slain in battle, and he lost about 1,700 or so cavalrymen. These would be troops who would be very hard to replace, and perhaps this is why Saif's army was now so prone to defeat after this. Many of these men who were captured were later featured in Constantine VII's last triumph in 958. While this victory at Raban was not enough to break the power of the Emirate of Aleppo, it did inflict real damage, and we'll see that a couple years later, when Leo destroys another army that Saif leads out, that that victory would be more or less decisive. Had it not been for this victory first, then perhaps Leo's victory over Saif would not have been quite so fatal. I think it is something of a combination of Raban and then Leo's grand ambush in 960, which really did end Saif's power at Aleppo. In 959, Constantine VII died and he was succeeded by his son, Romanus II. During this time, 959 to 963, we don't really know very much about what Zemiskis was up to. We only have some rather vague notions, and he seems to have played something of a secondary role in the operations of this four-year reign. I assume he was left in charge of the east while his uncle Leo was sent west and Nicephorus was sent to capture Crete. However, when Nicephorus was on Crete, he took away many of the best units in the army, and this left the frontier armies dangerously denuded. It would appear that Zemiskis was left with the task of containing Saif, who would try to take advantage, and holding the line in general against any threats which may emerge. Saif took up the opportunity, and he was able to penetrate into Cappadocia before Leo, fresh off of a victory in the Balkans, arrived 
and defeated him in another grand victory. This is the 960 victory I alluded to earlier, where Leo ambushed a plunder-laden army under um, Saif and almost completely destroyed it. What this implies is either that Zemiskis was tied down with obligations elsewhere, or else he had previously challenged Saif and been defeated. It's also possible that he was trying to lure Saif out of Cappadocia, so he had raided into Saif's territory or something of that nature. At any rate, the real hero on the home front was definitely Leo, who achieved two victories, one in Europe and one in Anatolia, both of them within a very short period of time. The other great hero on the home front was Marianos Arguros. If anything, Zemiskis was at best a distant third, so he did not gain any distinction really during that period of time. We also know that as Nicephorus resumed his command as Domesticus of the East and tried to start softening up Cilicia, that Zemiskis once again would lead Eastern operations, but we don't know all that much about the details of what he did, and he didn't achieve any real signal successes during that period of time. When Romanus II died, he was still a young man in his 20s, and his two children were about five and three years old, respectively. This meant that he left behind a young widow, and both she and the boys would require a protector. Now, as an empire-wide hero, Nicephorus Phocas was a pretty obvious choice. However, the eunuch in charge of Constantinople at the time, Joseph Bringas, had other ideas. He thought that Nicephorus would threaten his own control of the government, and he began to seek for other candidates. I've argued in the past that his ideal candidate to serve as emperor was Marianos Arguros, a general who had served in Italy and then in the Balkans. One of the other people he approached, interestingly enough, probably just to undermine Nicephorus more so than to make a genuine offer, was John Zemiskis. He sent him a letter urging him to betray his uncle, take up the command of Domesticus of the East, and wait a while, and then eventually he would receive the throne in his own right. Zemiskis may have been tempted by this offer. We know from later details that he clearly had some interest in this kind of power, but at this time he seems to have not thought the opportunity very appealing. Zemiskis immediately took the letter to his uncle Nicephorus. He didn't want to be accused of treason, so one way to do that is to come out up front and admit what had occurred in terms of the offer from Bringas. Nicephorus did not react the way that Zemiskis had hoped. He just seemed stunned and he wouldn't really speak or act for a long period of time. This seems to have really frustrated Zemiskis and another general who was there to no end, and they effectively demanded that Nicephorus act because they said that if he didn't act, someone would surely kill him and they might just go ahead and save him the trouble of awaiting death by killing him themselves if he was going to leave them hanging by not doing what he needed to do. Of course, this is somewhat on the nose in light of what happened later. Nicephorus accordingly took up their advice and had his troops declare him emperor on July 3rd, 963. A mere, what's that, 900 years before the Battle of Gettysburg? To the day, at least the final day, take his charge. Fun fact. While his uncle competed with Bringas and Marianos Arguros for power in Constantinople, Zemiskis held down the east. After Nicephorus had been crowned, he officially confirmed that Zemiskis was to succeed him as Domesticus of the East. By the end of the year 963, however, both Nicephorus and Leo were back in the East commanding armies because the new emperor decided that he wanted to complete his project of conquering Cilicia in person. By the end of the year, all three Fakatis would be commanding troops and gearing up for a grand push on Cilicia. The first blow, which was a heavy blow, was struck by Zemiskis in December of 963. During one of his invasions, he was trying to capture the city of Adana when the Muslim cities in Cilicia formed a coalition force. Not only did Zemiskis win this battle, but he won it in overwhelming fashion. 
After routing the enemy, 5,000 or so of them took refuge on a nearby hill, and they thought they were safe there and then could perhaps retreat by night. However, Zemiskis was able to successfully pursue them and then slaughtered them where they stood on the hill. This hill later became known as the Mountain of Blood. This, without a doubt, really broke the spirit of the Cilicians, and I would argue that this is the key event in the fall of Cilicia. After this point, the cities of Cilicia stood in no doubt about their chances against a Byzantine army in the field, and they would have also lost many of their best men on the field of battle. They were dependent upon the help of the Emir of Aleppo, the now elderly Saif, who arrived with an army too late. He had to come in a litter because he had already been crippled by a stroke. However, Saif was still dedicated to his job, but in this case, he was far too late to help his allies, and he would never quite be able to restore the trust they had formerly held in him after the Mountain of Blood. 964 was more or less a year of minor operations, just dealing with Saif and then preparing for a grand push in the Cilicia. In the summer of 965, the three Fakadis decided to make the big plunge. In this invasion, they were focused on two major targets, the last two outstanding major Muslim strongholds of Mopsuestia and Tarsus. The governor of Tarsus, which was the larger of the two, requested terms. He knew that it was over and that there's no way that they and their ally Saif had any chance of holding back these Byzantine armies. However, Nicephorus was uninterested in coexisting with a Muslim governor. He declined the offer and decided that outright conquest was the way forward. Nicephorus accompanied Zemiskis, um, and the two of them went together to Mopsuestia. This ended up being a fairly tough fight, which required some extensive tunneling operations before the city fell on July 13th. The city was then subject to a fairly brutal sack. Afterwards, Zemiskis must have stayed behind with his men to gather things and settle affairs, while Nicephorus led away some of the troops and joined Leo at Tarsus before the final assault there. Those were the last two major actions, although there were some minor actions later which completed the conquest of Cilicia. Late in 965, perhaps even after all three of the Fakadis had left the area, the final independent Muslim city fell to Byzantine forces, and it was around this same time that Nicephorus celebrated a triumph at the capital. Meanwhile, however, Nicephorus decided, for reasons that are not entirely clear, to relieve Zemiskis of his command and send him home to his ancestral estate in Cappadocia. The charges that Nicephorus put against his nephew are far from clear. It seems possible that it was based on some sort of rumor. Perhaps Zemiskis had been engaging in some kind of intrigue with the wrong people at Constantinople, or perhaps it was merely an unsubstantiated rumor. It's all unclear. We don't really know. And we also don't know, in light of later events, whether Nicephorus' suspicions were well-founded or just simple paranoia. It's possible that he noticed his nephew was much more popular than himself, and he feared that in the long run, being someone who was sonless, that Zemiskis might just simply usurp him, especially if Zemiskis continued to win the favor of the armies of the East. We know that Zemiskis had a manner which went over very well with soldiers as well. Whatever the reasons, though, Z uh, Zemiskis found himself sidelined and for a while he was confined to the interior of Anatolia, unable to really do anything, perhaps under something like house arrest. By 969, it seems that Nicephorus' suspicions had lifted to some extent, and Zemiskis had won permission to travel as far as Chalcedon. Supposedly, according to some of the more scandalous sources, this was arranged by Theophano, the empress, who was having an affair with Zemiskis and wanted him across the Bosporus so that they would be able to visit one another. Most likely, though, it was simply a thawing out of relationships between uncle and nephew after several years where Zemiskis had behaved himself and not caused any problems for Nicephorus's throne. We don't really know what Zemiskis' feelings or intentions toward his uncle were back in 965. However, by 969, 
he had clearly developed a deep hatred of his uncle, and he was determined to be rid of him by any means necessary. It appears that plenty of other people in Constantinople felt the same way. These people included high government officials, fellow generals who had been removed from command and felt that it was undeserved, um, civil officials, people who worked in the church who were sick of Nicephorus's interference, and common people. The reasons for Nicephorus's unpopularity, to boil it down, were due to the combination of constant warfare, which required constant taxation. That would have been bad enough on its own, but most emperors were smart enough to realize that you have to keep up public morale at the capital by keeping the people entertained. Well, Nicephorus didn't seem to understand that or at least care about it, and as someone who was very frugal personally, he assumed that others needed to act that way too, so he really cut back on public entertainments. This meant that all of the massive amounts of popularity he accrued early on in his career by capturing Crete and then Cilicia were completely and totally squandered by his failure to keep people entertained and yet keep milking them for money to build his own glory. He also for the elite was someone who they found exasperating on a personal level. He was humorless and he tended to be a very harsh critic of the people around him on a number of issues. So they simply didn't enjoy working with him and they were always afraid of being fired and exiled as it happened to Zemisky's Michael Bortzi's despite the fact he had captured Antioch and many others. Now the sources allege that Theophano was also a major part of this plot and that she was eager to be rid of Nicephorus, who she found disgusting, and part of it was because she was in love with the much better looking Zemiskis and that this was all part of her plan to get a more attractive and more loving husband. But in reality, it would have been very foolish for her to have done anything of the sort because she already had someone who was clearly a rather dedicated and capable protector of the boy emperors Basil and Constantine. So if she did something like that for real, it would have been incredibly ill-advised and therefore is unlikely. We do know, however, that Zemiskis did have some pretty powerful allies who were involved. Basil Lycopinus, the illegitimate son of the late emperor Romanus Lycopinus and an uncle to the boy emperors, does not seem to have directly participated, but he was certainly privy to it and would join them almost immediately. The general Michael Bortzi's rather fresh off of his dismissal after he captured Antioch against orders, was also furious with Nicephorus and thought that he had been deeply wronged. There were other generals present and officials, but I won't go into them because they don't really play that big of a role in later history. The arrangement was for uh, Zemiskis to cross the Bosporus, meet with these conspirators in the palace, and then for them to kill Nicephorus in the middle of the night before his bodyguards could react. The idea is that if they killed him before the bodyguards arrived, these guards would have no reason to retaliate, and they could simply establish Zemiskis as emperor and move on with their lives. It's a pretty far-fetched plot in a lot of ways. It is somewhat Dr. Evil-esque in its complexity and also its contingency, but it worked. The assassination was planned for the night of December 10th. Unfortunately for the conspirators, especially Zemiskis, he was forced to endure a harrowing unlit night journey across the Bosporus in a small boat. This could have very well ended up killing him if the boat had capsized and he had drowned. He was late getting there, and the conspirators were on the verge of panic when he arrived. However, he managed to restore heart in them, and they hauled each other up into the palace. In some versions of this, the Empress Theophano was busily hiding them away in rooms that were unused and keeping them away from even the servants. However, it's more likely that they found somebody inside the palace and they were all hauled up into a window or something of that nature. They then had to do some other complex maneuver to get into the wing of the palace that um, Nicephorus himself was in, because again, they had to move around very stealthily to avoid alerting the guards. When they arrived in Nicephorus's chamber, they at first panicked, again, because his bed was empty. They thought either he had found out about the plot somehow, or else he was out taking a stroll in the middle of the night, 
and he would soon come back with guards. But then they realized that he was just asleep on the floor on a rug, because as an ascetic, he thought that it was too soft and privileged for a sinner such as himself to be sleeping on a bed. So they then accosted him and woke him up, started slashing him, beating him up. He was thrown at Zemiskis' feet, and Zemiskis announced denounced his injustice and ingratitude, then kicking him while pulling out his hair and beard. This implies that Zemiskis was crying with rage and really just absolutely developed a deep hatred of his uncle who he felt had betrayed him. So perhaps it is possible that he had once cared for his uncle up until four years ago, and that his sidelining had been a harsh enough experience to completely change his feelings. Ultimately, I suppose, ambition must outweigh family ties, at least for the elite. Basil, the uh, member of the Lacopinus family, that is, announced Nicephorus's death to the palace and then went out in the snowy streets and kept announcing it, hailing John Zemiskis along with the two boy emperors. When the Varangian Guard, which at this point was not really a battle unit, more or less just a bodyguard unit, arrived, they found the deed accomplished, and so, like the foreign bodyguards of many early Roman emperors, they simply decided that they needed a new job, so Zemiskis was as good as anyone in terms of uh, someone they could protect. As long as they got paid and hopefully got a little bit of a bonus for transferring their loyalty, all was good and all was forgiven. As Anthony Caldellus commented in his recent book on this period, Zemisky showed the mind of a master politician in the aftermath of the assassination. He began immediately to act as an emperor by making and unmaking appointments to make sure that people loyal to himself were in positions of power. He also proclaimed himself alongside of Basil II and Constantine VIII so that he could appear as their protector and as someone who was working ultimately on their behalf rather than as a usurper in the traditional sense. In order to get a formal coronation, he had to engage in negotiations with Patriarch Polyuctus. Polyuctus, luckily, while he was somewhat stiff-necked and ascetic, was not really that huge of a fan of Nicephorus, so he was able to make some policy trades in order to get an arrangement that was acceptable. In exchange for canceling Nicephorus's episcopal appointments, which had again constituted interference that the patriarch and other prelates did not enjoy, um, all that Zemiskis had to do otherwise was to find two minor conspirators and blame them for everything as if the whole assassination was their fault, not his. Obviously, he and his chief conspirators benefited the most, but it was the minor players who ended up getting executed, so makes sense. I guess the idea is that it would be too impious to have an outright murder on the throne, at least in the eyes of Polyuctus, who was going to perform the coronation. So this was sort of an official story to uh, expiate the sins of Zemiskis. He was also required to perform a kind of formal expiation by giving away his wealth, his personal wealth that is. He gave away half of his own private property to small farmers in Thrace who had been suffering and then he used the other half to endow a house for lepers on the outskirts of Constantinople. There's some evidence that he may have genuinely been sorry that he killed his uncle. Either that or he was genuinely concerned for lepers since he actually did visit this house for lepers on several occasions and apparently was quite warm to the patients there. He was formally crowned in the Hagia Sophia and proclaimed by the army and people on December 25th, 969. Polyuctus himself crowned the new emperor, and from this point forward, Zemiskis would act as the autocrat of the Byzantine world with full legitimacy and with surprisingly few challenges given exactly how he'd come to power. In November of 970, Zemiskis would further cement himself in the Byzantine order by marrying Romanist II's sister, Theodora. Theodora was not exactly what we would call attractive, however, she was known for her intelligence, and she did give um, Zemiskis a legitimate marriage into the Macedonian dynasty, which was far more important than having an attractive spouse if you are aspiring to hold the throne and retain your legitimacy. It was around this time, 
according to Anthony Caldellis, that Zemiskis most likely invented the idea that Theophano was responsible in order to create another scapegoat who would be a little more plausible than the two poor schmucks that he had thrown under the bus and executed in order to appease Polyuctus. But the story of Zemisky's affair, Caldellus argues, actually originates from the period when the Fakadis revolted against Basil II in the 980s. So Zemisky's most likely would not have made himself out to be someone engaging in an adulterous affair against his uncle and then murdering him. Murdering him was bad enough on its own. So most likely this was invented later by a group of people who were also hostile to Zemisky's. This would also deepen the idea of Theophano as an evil seductress and plotter. Zemisky's, though, would not want to appear as someone who was easily pliable. And one sign of weakness in this period was if a man had a weakness for some woman who was then able to effectively tell him what to do. So very unlikely that Zemisky's would have spread any stories about his affair with Theophano, whether it was true or whether it never happened at all, which is more likely. A later vernacular poem captures the mood that this created and the image of Theophano, which has more or less endured to this day. In this poem, Theodora was able to capture the prize that Theophano had plotted for for years, while Theophano was led away into exile on a mule by, quote, the men with shriveled cocks and gaping assholes, which, of course, is just a derogatory way to refer to eunuchs who supposedly all engaged in homosexual acts because they had no testicles. At any rate, um, Theophano's name has been blackened, and I think that Caldellus and others who propose that a lot of it is just pure abuse in order to try to shift the blame away from Zemiskis and from other actors, that most likely Theophano was more or less just a puppet in this. And as I said, I don't think there's a very strong incentive for her to kill and overthrow Nicephorus, given that he was the protector of her sons and that they were still not that close to manhood in 969. In December of 969, as part of his consolidation of power, Zemiskis had the Focades arrested and exiled. Leo Focas and one of his sons, Nicephorus, was sent to Lesbos, whereas um, Bardos Focas, the most talented of Leo's sons, was commanding troops in Anatolia. He was simply arrested and then imprisoned locally. As for appointments, Zemiskis obviously wanted to make sure that men loyal to himself were in positions of power, so he promoted Bardas Sclerus, his former brother-in-law, to the office of Stratolates, which simply means something like army leader, and then he either kept or appointed for the first time Basil Lacopinus as Perikoimomenos, an office which would enable Basil to effectively run the finances and administration of the empire. For the most part, Zemisky seems to have been able to deputize to a much greater extent than his uncle had, and Basil will more or less run the government while Zemisky commands the armies and directs grand strategy. Early in 970 in February, the patriarch Polyuctus died, so Zemisky was able to choose his replacement, and he chose another ascetic but someone who was much friendlier to himself, Basil Scamandrinus, and this new patriarch would remain in power for the rest of Zemisky's time as emperor. Zemisky's plan to challenge the Rus, who had overrun Bulgaria late in the reign of Nicephorus II, but this plan would, of course, be derailed by a revolt that we'll get to that occurs in 971. In 970, Zemiskis probably wisely decided that he shouldn't leave Constantinople lest some intrigue arise and challenge his throne. Therefore, when the Rus led by Seviatoslav began to raid from Bulgaria into Byzantine Thrace, he decided that he would have to entrust his generals with the defense of the frontier. Peter Phokas, one of Nicephorus's nephews and a kinsman of the new emperor, was entrusted with the early defense of Thrace. 
Interestingly enough, Peter was a eunuch who was also the only member of the Fakadis who held Zemiskis as emperor and worked for him. Peter was quite experienced. He had served in the East and fought with distinction. He was able to keep Thrace safe by using his personal bravery and his ability to avoid battle. His overall instructions from Zemiskis were to not engage the Rus in an outright battle. He followed those instructions. And in one minor encounter with the Magyars, he was able to kill the Magyar leader in personal combat. This seems to have somewhat demoralized the Magyar contingent of Seviatoslav's army, at least for the time being. After this humiliating setback and the cat and mouse game between himself and Peter Fokas, Seviatoslav became more eager than ever for a decisive battle. So he began to recruit more men by aligning himself even closer to the nobility among the Magyars, the Pechenegs, and even some of the Bulgarian boyars who he had recently conquered. This enabled him to raise a truly large army. Zanaris and John Skalitsis claim that the Rus were able to manage to raise about 300,000 men in total, but as modern scholars have pointed out, 50,000 is a much more plausible number, and it would be an army of 50,000 most likely that um, Zemiskis' generals would have to contend with. Meanwhile, Bardas Scleris, the senior general under Zemiskis, arrived and took command from Peter. Scleris arrived with reinforcements and brought the troop total up to about 12,000 or so. This meant that while this was a relatively sizable army, they were still considerably outnumbered by the Rus, and they would have to be quite careful. That being said, this was a very high-quality Byzantine army, full of veterans and with quality officers. So while they were outnumbered nearly five to one, they still were a force to be reckoned with. Bardas Scleris knew that he would have to fight the enemy on conditions which were as favorable as possible. So his strategy was to feign fear of the enemy in order to lure them in and fight them on favorable grounds, and also to inspire overconfidence so that the enemy would make moves that he could take advantage of. Advancing towards Adrianople, Scleris feigned something like panic and uh, dismay when he noticed the enemy numbers, and then he began to slowly retreat as if he were simply demoralized. It appears that Seviatoslav bought that Scleris was simply scared and began to pursue rather vigorously. During this pursuit, Scleris decided to engage in some minor skirmishing where he thought that the quality of his troops would ensure that they could whittle down the numbers and morale of this much larger pursuing force. Scleris accordingly dispatched a cavalry unit under the patrician John Alakas in order to lure the enemy out and draw them into a trap. It was the Pechenegs who took the bait, and they chased Alakas into a shallow valley. The Byzantines managed to keep them uh, and chase by keeping the distance respectable enough that the Pechenegs thought they were on the verge of catching them. However, when they entered this valley, the Byzantine cavalry suddenly wheeled about and counterattacked, while additional ambushers emerged from the hillside and started to advance. This led to a slaughter of the Pechenegs, who were eliminated as an effective force in Seviatoslav's army. They also would come to hold a heavy grudge against Seviatoslav, who had not supported the Pechenegs who had gone off in pursuit. So this would later come back to haunt Seviatoslav. Without knowing it, Bardas Scleris had actually really sown the seeds of Seviatoslav's demise with this small ambush action. A few days later, not far from Adrianople, the two armies squared off in an open battle at Arcadiopolis. Here, the battle would be very closely contested. Leo the Deacon and Skylitzes both claim that Bardos and his brother Constantine were forced to engage in personal combat and overcome enemy champions in order to keep their men going and ultimately win the day. It's worth noting, before we go any further, that Leo the Deacon knew Zemiskis and that they were friends. This also makes it highly likely that Leo the Deacon had a strong personal bias in favor of Bardas Scleris, and most likely he also was friends with him. 
That being said, the battle clearly did go in favor of the Byzantines, and after a hard, long fight, it devolved into a slaughter of the Rus, which then forced Sevyatoslav to fall back to his stronghold in Bulgaria. Back in Constantinople, the new emperor Zemiskis was mustering men from the eastern armies, stripping some of them a little bit thinner than might be ideal, and he was preparing to lead an invasion of Bulgaria the following year, where he would capitalize on the victories of Sclerus and Peter Phokas. As you probably already know, this doesn't happen, because another event in the east will distract Zemiskis from making this invasion of Bulgaria a reality. As I mentioned before, Nicephorus II had no sons of his own, however his brother Leo did, and perhaps it was this potential succession dispute which led to the tension between Nicephorus II and Zemiskis in the first place. At any rate, um, Zemiskis had, of course, imprisoned and exiled Leo and his sons, and he thought that this problem was contained. However, and not surprisingly, it was the most talented of Leo's sons, Bardas, a man who inherited the skills of both his uncle Nicephorus and his father Leo, who would be the one to lead the revolt. Bardas escaped from his prison in Cappadocia and went to the army at Caesarea and started a revolt. Meanwhile, Leo and his other son Nicephorus were able to escape from Lesbos and they tried to enter in the Thrace and rally the troops there. However, they found themselves quickly captured and then handed over to authorities. News of this revolt prevented Zemiskis from mounting his invasion of Bulgaria in 971, and he would in fact spend the rest of the year in the capital just like he had the year before. This means once again he was forced to turn to his generals to deal with the problem while he remained at home. Unlike his late uncle Nicephorus, Zemiskis was a pretty big believer in diplomacy, and he decided to try to negotiate with Bardos Phokas after the capture of Leo and Bardos' brother. However, Bardos refused Zemiskis' offer of a pardon and the free use of his property, and instead began to march forward with several thousand men. I presume the hope of Bardos is that he could use his tactical talents in order to inflict a defeat upon the Emperor and then make more men rally to his banners. Zemiskis, for his part, was a little too smart to take that risk, and instead he decided that Sclera should be the one to meet with Bardos and face him in battle. Zemiskis called off the invasion of Bulgaria and then sent Sclerus with some of the best and most loyal men into Anatolia to come face to face with Bardas. Rather than fight Bardas head to head, it seems that he had quite a reputation as a formidable commander, Sclerus instead disguised some of his agents as beggars and sent them into Bardas's camp where they were in, they informed all the men that full pardons were being offered by the emperor and that this would be a no harm, no foul situation, and they could all return to the normal ranks. For whatever reason, the men do not seem to have been that dedicated to Bardos, despite the fact that they had actually revolted for him just weeks before, and the army dwindled away over the course of perhaps a week. Bardos' following was then reduced to a few hundred men, and he took these men and holed up in a fort at Tyropoion. The revolt of Bardos Phokas showed that while the Phokas name did not carry the kind of weight that it had before Nicephorus's reign, it still commanded loyalty among many in the army. So Bardos Phokas and others were still very dangerous people to have about. Zemiskis at first seems to have been very angry with them and decided that they were a great threat, so he decided to execute Leo and Nicephorus but then he decided to commute the sentence to mere blinding. And then upon further reflection, commuted it again to just renewed exile on Lesbos. At Tyro Poyon, presumably acting on behalf of his emperor, Sclerus laid siege and then convinced Bardos to surrender. He offered to spare the family of Bardos Phokas and his hardcore followers, terms that which were too generous for Bardos to refuse. 
Zemiskis then decided that Bardos and his family could go unmolested to the island of Chios. This is a fairly nice island in the Aegean, and it is not the worst place of exile one could imagine. Of course, those of you who are familiar with the reign of Basil II know that Bardos Phokas was not done quite yet. However, he will not reemerge from Chios until after the death of Zemiskis. Interestingly enough, it would appear that at least some of Bardos' descendants decided to stick around the island of Chios because in 1586, an Italian visitor to the island reported meeting Focas family descendants who were living as peasants in one of the villages there. After the failed rebellion of Bardos Focas, we hear of no further challenges to Zemiskis' authority. So his clemency was something which was worthy of Julius Caesar, and unlike Caesar's clemency, it actually paid off and he did not end up getting murdered on the Ides of March. To say that Nicephorus II had engaged in anything resembling diplomacy, at least on a competent level, would be to very much stretch the meaning of the word diplomacy to the point where it means nothing. His nephew, Zemiskis, however, was much more adept at the art of negotiation, and he decided to use diplomacy in order to gain what he wanted in Italy, which was peace with the Western Emperor. Zemiskis, unlike many previous Byzantine emperors, was not against sending Byzantine princesses to marry foreign leaders. The woman he found to marry into the ruling house of the Empire of the West was his niece, Theophano. His niece was 16 at the time, and she was to be wed to the 17-year-old Otto, who would later become Otto II, then the heir apparent of the throne of the West. It was quite a good match for young Theophano, who of course had not been born into the purple. That being said, this was also a concern in the West, where many at court were at first outraged at how cheap Zemiskis had been by sending his own niece rather than some member of the Macedonian dynasty. However, for whatever reason, they changed their mind about young Theophano, and they decided that she was a perfectly acceptable choice. So she was eventually accepted and lived a rather happy life in the West, at least after the first few months of being shunned. Uh, then she, of course, was accepted, became empress. Um, she married Otto II on April 14, 972. She later gave birth to Otto III, and his upbringing was more like that of a Greek than a Saxon because Theophano would maintain something of a private Greek-style court within the palace. And Otto III, pictured here, would go on to take the throne after his own father's death. So this was ultimately a very successful arrangement for all involved, and it shows that Zemiskis was someone who knew how to use diplomacy in order to achieve strategic ends where he didn't have enough military force to simply take what he wanted by arms. That is something that you need to be able to do to be a successful emperor, and it shows me that had um, Zemiskis ruled longer, he would have kept accomplishing more things, since unlike his uncle, he was not one-dimensional. Although he had lost all of 971 to Bardos Phokas' revolt, Zemiskis was confident of victory and he had used his time well. In 971, while he was waiting at the capital for his grand campaign, he used his time to drill his Black Sea fleet and also make an alliance with Venice. This alliance would pay off in the short run because later on he'll find himself at odds once again with the Muslim powers in the east and he will persuade Venice to also refuse to sell naval materials such as timber to any Muslim powers. As for Seviatoslav in Bulgaria, he does not seem to have used his time nearly so wisely as Zemiskis. We don't know exactly what he was trying to do. Presumably he was trying to consolidate his hold on Bulgaria. We also know that he was clearly awaiting the attack of Zemiskis. So Whatever his plan was is not entirely clear, and not to give too much of a spoiler, but it failed. Before leaving the city, Zemiskis decided to lead a long procession to the Hagia Sophia, 
where he paraded around with a gold frame fragment of the True Cross. Then he went to the port and saw off his fleet. They had their own operation to conduct. He would be marching on foot. So after that, he joined with his troops and they began to march out to meet with the Army of the Balkans. And from there, they would then march into Bulgaria. He started marching relatively early, probably in March. And as we'll see, it was not typical at this time to set out before Easter. So Zemiskis was actually getting a pretty good head start. When Zemiskis arrived at Adrianople to collect his army before setting out to the north, he found it slightly demoralized. This was due to the lackluster and lackadaisical conduct of his drunk cousin, John Kirkawas. This John Kirkawas was not worthy of the name he bore, and he clearly was not on the same level of generalship as, say, Zemiskis or any of his other relatives. We don't know if John Kirkawas was dismissed for this failing or what happened to him, but we do know that Zemiskis did restore morale pretty quickly as the army began to march north into Bulgaria. Very luckily for Zemiskis, Seviatoslav had assumed that Zemiskis would remain at Constantinople long enough to celebrate Easter, so he accordingly had not taken the time and effort to plug up the passes into Bulgaria with small garrisons. And so Zemiskis found that his path into the heartland of Bulgaria was wide open, and he found passages that had been used by Constantine V and Nicephorus I in the past completely unguarded. He passed right through and emerged north of Preslov, or south of Preslov, excuse me, and he was holding the high ground over the Rus camp and the city. Now, because he held these advantages and he had the element of surprise with him, he decided that the time to strike was now. Once he arrived there, the Rus figured out what had happened and they hastily assembled to offer battle. The two forces engaged in battle at a river not far from Preslov. This battle raged on for a long time with great intensity, but there was no sign of either side gaining an upper hand after a long, hard slog. At just the right moment, as both sides were nearing exhaustion, Zemiskis unleashed his personal guard and they were able to break the ruse. Then the Imperial Cavalry, which started out on higher ground, was able to sweep down and engage in a devastating pursuit all the way to the walls of Preslov, effectively wiping out the Rus army as an effective field force. So this shows that especially when you hold the high ground, if you achieve a rout, a cavalry pursuit can be absolutely devastating. Once Zemiskis arrived at the walls of Preslov, he was quickly able to storm the city. While a number of Rus had managed to make it inside of the walls, they were still disheartened and disorganized, and they had no way to break the momentum of the Byzantine army. However, once Zemiskis and his men penetrated the city walls themselves, they found that the citadel was still very hard to take because there were just enough Rus to hold on to it. Zemiskis, however, was undeterred, so in order to smoke out the garrison, he took apart some wooden houses, set them on fire, and forced the Rus to choose between being burned out and surrender. The Rus chose their lives, and this also meant that they spared their hostages. Most of the hostages were Bulgarian boyars who were kept there to ensure the good behavior of the Bulgarians more broadly, but without a doubt, the VIPs among the hostages were Tsar Boris and his family. Zemiskis greeted his fellow monarch warmly enough and talked in the language of brotherhood. He said that he was there simply to liberate Bulgaria from the Rus and that he had no intentions of conquering Boris's kingdom. Whether Boris believed him or not is unclear. I imagine that the game was kind of exposed some when Zemiskis not only chose to celebrate Easter in Boris's capital, but also decided to rename the former uh, imperial city as Eonopolis which is to say that he named it after himself in Greek. And after this, Zemiskis marched toward Dori Stolon, which was the last stronghold of Seviatoslav. His fleet was keeping Seviatoslav in check, 
and without the army that had been smashed earlier at Preslov, Sevyatoslav was more or less stuck on the coast at Dori Stolen, trying to figure out how to escape from Bulgaria and the mess he'd created for himself in the area. The naval drills of 971 seemed to have paid off. One has to imagine that Sevyatoslav sent for his fleet and that they probably challenged the Byzantines at some point, but apparently to no effect. Either that or the Byzantine fleet was so efficient at preventing communications that the Rus fleet had no idea where Sevyatoslav was. At any rate, Sevyatoslav received no reinforcements, and he was more or less stranded on the coast of the Black Sea. This meant that Zemiskis was able to march in a relatively leisurely fashion to the coast in order to lay siege by land to the port city of Dori Stolen. Sevyatoslav refused to yield, and also Zemiskis tried to mount an assault on the city, having succeeded in that in the recent past, but this attempt at a storm failed. Storms usually only work when a city is highly disorganized or taken by surprise. Dori Stolon, while the morale there probably wasn't super high, was at least somewhat organized, and the garrison was well established. So it was somewhat of a foolish attempt on Zemisky's part to attempt to storm such a city. Realizing that it would take a long time to starve out the Rus, Zemisky's on July 24th decided to use another um, age-old tactic of the Byzantine army. When he used a feign withdrawal to provoke a sally from the undisciplined Sevyatoslav, this led to a very stiff battle, one in which um, Zemiskis eventually emerged victorious, and after suffering defeat in this way, Sevyatoslav, who was beginning to run out of supplies, decided to surrender. The two monarchs had a face-to-face -face meeting, which was surprisingly friendly, and they discussed possibly restoring the old commercial treaty where members of the Rus were enabled to visit Constantinople in small groups, so this was restored, at least in theory, and the two departed more or less as friends, or at least two people who had something of an understanding. Sevyatoslav seems to have been genuinely humbled by this defeat, and most likely he would not have troubled Zemiskis any further. The official terms of Sevyatoslav's surrender were that he would evacuate all of Bulgaria, hand over all prisoners that he had, Bulgarian, Byzantine, or otherwise, and also promised to never attack the Byzantine colony at Cherson in the uh, Crimea. As for Sevyatoslav, in return, not only did he receive the life of himself and his men, but he also was given food and then escorted to the Danube. Unfortunately for Sevyatoslav, the seeds of his fate had already been sown a few years before. If you'll recall when um, Sclerus used Alakas' cavalry to draw out the Pechenegs and then butcher them in an ambush. This is something that the Pechenegs still were clinging on to as a source of bitterness. And they personally blamed Sevyatoslav for the combination of their losses and the lack of spoils they had received from this campaign where they had contributed and lost so much. Apparently Sevyatoslav had not gotten to the point where he had started to pay off the Magyars and the Pechenegs with the spoils of war. So while Sevyatoslav was trying to cross the Deniper River to get back to his homeland, the Pechenegs caught up to him and attacked him during the crossing, which resulted in the death of this Rus leader. Sevyatoslav didn't just disappear, however, into the mist of history. Instead, his body was dismembered and his skull was turned into a drinking cup a similar fate to what had happened to Nicephorus I back around 811. Zemiskis took his spoils and returned to Constantinople, where he celebrated another triumph. In this triumph, Tsar Boris and his family were on display, and it was clear that what Zemiskis was trying to demonstrate is that he had conquered Bulgaria. It's unclear, however, exactly how much of this Tsar Boris was let in on beforehand. When the procession ended, Zemiskis retired the Bulgarian regalia at the Hagia Sophia and declared that the annexation of Bulgaria would begin immediately and that it was now part of the Byzantine Empire. As for the now deposed Tsar Boris and his family, they were treated pretty hospitably. 
Boris was granted the rank of Magister, and his younger brother was castrated for good measure to ensure that he wouldn't return to Bulgaria and try to launch a revolt. In addition, Zemiskis incorporated the Bulgarian church structure into the Byzantine uh, Orthodox structure. The Patriarch of Bulgaria as an office was abolished, and Bulgarian bishops were now told that they had to report to the Patriarch of Constantinople. One has to imagine that his new patriarch was rather pleased with all of this and thought that it had been a good idea to get on Zemisky's good side since now his personal power had been enhanced quite a bit. Zemisky's decision to annex all of Bulgaria was bold, but under the circumstances it made quite a bit of sense. Bulgaria at this time seemed to be a fairly weak kingdom, and leaving it that weak only meant that most likely Seviatoslav or some other person would sweep in and create a new and more vigorous threat on the borders of Byzantium. The temptation to expand to the north was far too tempting, and it's hard to blame Zemiskis for acting as he did. However, it seems that he didn't live long enough to really reconcile the conquered Bulgarians with Byzantine rule. It seems that the progress, such as it was in Bulgaria, was almost entirely made in the eastern third or so of the country, that part of Bulgaria which faces the Black Sea and which is closest linked to the Byzantine world, both geographically and economically. If we're looking at the western two-thirds of Bulgaria, however, we're talking about an area which could not reconcile itself with Byzantine rule. There was a lot of support for some kind of renewed Bulgarian leadership, and people there were waiting for a champion to emerge. This would ultimately be the sort of catalyst and the um, fuel for a later Bulgarian empire to emerge from the ashes of the old. However, Zemiskis would not live long enough to see these problems bear fruit, as these would later become a problem for his successor years after Zemiskis was dead and buried. For the most part, the East had been relatively quiet during the first couple years of Zemisky's rule. This should come as no surprise since Saif of Aleppo had been long dead and the Abbasids were deep in decay. However, this changed to some extent when another major power arrived on the scene. This power was the Fatimid Caliphate. In 971, they arrived and started seizing territory in South Syria which then put them into contact with the Byzantine world, at least in the east. Of course, they'd already clashed Byzantine forces in Sicily and Italy and had been at odds for quite some time on that theater. The Fatimids themselves were Shia Muslims of the Ismaili branch, and their rulers, while they were called caliphs, combined sacred and secular authority, so they served as both imam and caliph they were able to make religious proclamations as well as run the government and command the armies. The Fatimids, because of the differences in their religious views when compared to the Sunni Muslims who ran the caliphate, were hostile to the legitimacy claims of the Abbasid caliphs. This was important because it meant that there was very little chance of the Fatimids coming in as champions and becoming something like the new Saif on the scene. This also meant that it would be unlikely to see much cooperation between the Fatimids and Baghdad. For Byzantium, this was a pretty good thing. The real thing that held back the Fatimids and prevented them from really trying to threaten Byzantine power in Syria, however, is that there was a rival Ismaili group in the area called the Karmatians. The Karmatians had gained control of Arabia, and they, over the next several years, will challenge the Fatimids in Syria and Palestine on a pretty consistent basis. This will mean that the Fatimids will not be able to mount a major offensive against the Byzantines, despite wanting to. So what this does is it establishes something like a kind of um, standoff between the Fatimids and the Byzantines, where neither side has quite enough power to openly and meaningfully challenge the other, but the possibility is always there. 
While it is now apparent to us that the Fatimids would never really pose much of a threat to Byzantium, there was no way to know that, and based on past experience, the Byzantines assumed naturally that the Fatimids were a formidable foe. They had seen what they could do in Sicily and Italy, and they took the arrival of the Fatimids very seriously in the east. Accordingly, Zemiskis himself visited the east the same year that he had triumphed over Bulgaria. Late in 972, he arrived with his men and then invaded northern Mesopotamia. There, he was able to capture the city of Nisibis on October 12th and sack the city. He then moved north against the city of Myaferican, but he was not successful there. At one point, he also impressed upon the emir of Mosul the futility of resistance, so Abu Taglib, the emir of Mosul, agreed to pay an annual tribute. So, this was not a brilliant campaign, but it was something that had some successes, and it did show the continued weakness of the Abbasids even after a couple years to recover. When he returned home, he left the Domesticus Melius in command, and we're not really sure what Zemiskis did for the next few years, but he certainly was not campaigning in Mesopotamia. One of the most interesting facts about this campaign is that while Zemiskis was in northern Mesopotamia, the leaders of the Abbasid Caliphate tried to organize an army at Baghdad to oppose him. However, this effort led to a riot, and ultimately there was no attempt made to really stop Zemiskis. This implies that people were more or less not confident in the ability of the caliphate to deal with Zemiskis. Either that or it was a kind of draft riot of sorts where these men thought that they would just get eaten alive by the veteran Byzantine troops and that trying to raise an emergency army would only result in a complete and total slaughter. As I alluded to just now, and also as I mentioned at the outset, there actually are some considerable gaps in our knowledge about Zemiskis' life. One of those gaps comes in the middle of his reign. From late 972, after he withdrew from Mesopotamia, until the summer of 975, we don't really know where Zemiskis was at or what he was up to. We know that he was emperor, and that's about it. We do know, however, that his Damascus of the East kept up operations in Mesopotamia and Syria. Melius laid siege to Amida in early 973, but he was then defeated by the brother of the emir of Mosul in an ambush, and he was taken captive. A thousands of his men were killed at least, and their heads were sent to, ba to Baghdad for the caliph's inspection. As for Melius, he was taken to Mosul for safekeeping, and the intention seems to have been to exchange him in a prisoner exchange. However, he died in captivity early in 974, and he would never, of course, return home. Some of the sources claim that he was mistreated, but it is not clear that he was, and also it was not really customary to treat VIPs like senior commanders in that way, so most likely he was treated just fine, but he either died of injuries or some illness that people at the time had no way to really treat. Zemiskis probably arrived in the east to rectify this crisis created by Melius' defeat sometime in perhaps late 974 or maybe early 975. So um, this is probably the reason for his being in this theater in the first place, going into the summer of 975. In his book, Streams of Gold, Rivers of Blood, Anthony Caldellus posits that the campaign of 975 was designed to weaken Syria for a Cilicia-style annexation at a later date. The idea is that you go in, um, cause enough damage, and break up political organization enough that people just kind of give up hope and surrender. You then capture all of the relevant strongholds, install your own regimes, and do a little bit of colonization here and there, and you're good to go. I think that Caldellus was more or less correct, although I do disagree with him on the notion that because Syria was just too deep, this could never be done. Um, he also thinks that northern Mesopotamia could have never been conquered because it was so close to the Muslim heartland. But my counter would be to ask what political force was in place to actually prevent the Byzantines from doing this. So um, I do have a disagreement there with his account. Nonetheless, I very much do recommend his book to anyone listening right now. 
So the campaign in 975 was a pretty big success, but it's clear that it was the opening move in what was intended to be a larger project. The Fatimids in the south of Syria were very much weakened by Karmatian activity, so they posed no threat, and there was no real clash between the Byzantines and the Fatimids during this campaign, despite the fact that the emperor was in the field in person. However, the mobilization was large enough that it got the attention of the king of Armenia, Arshat III, who then raised a huge defense force in preparation for an invasion by Zemiskis. Zemiskis, who always was an adept diplomat, was able to convince him that, no, I'm actually going to Syria. I have no intention of harming Armenia. So Assad III gave up this um, intention of offensive action and instead actually sent some reinforcements to aid Zemiskis in his campaign. Now, there is a layer of myth which has attached itself to this campaign. Matthew of Edessa has an account written in the Crusade period which effectively turns this into a piece of propaganda designed to meet the needs of people living in the Crusader period. The idea is that Zemiskis was not just trying to expand the empire, but rather trying to liberate Christians at the Sea of Galilee and in Nazareth. That is totally false. We have no evidence he ever penetrated that far south. And also, he was not waging anything like a religious war. If he was fighting Muslim powers and replacing them with Christian rulers, then this was more about just expanding the empire and putting loyal people in place and less about what we would think of today as a holy war. If Zemiskis was not trying to liberate the Christians around the Sea of Galilee, what was he doing? Well, so far as we can tell, he was more or less just softening up Syria and trying to deepen Byzantine control so that later on he could go for an outright conquest. During this time, he fought no real notable battles, but more or less marched around unopposed and extracted tribute and then laid siege or ordered assaults as the opportunity presented itself. Zemiskis first went to the city of Baalbek and there he was actually challenged in the field for the first and only time by Alp Takin, a Turkish mercenary captain who had used his position of power to seize control of Damascus and establish himself as the ruler. Zemiskis was able to win this battle rather easily and then he was able to turn and capture Baalbek on May 29th. This, of course, resulted in a sack, and this would have been where Zemiskis took away quite a bit of the wealth that he earned on this campaign. He then took his army to Damascus, and at this point, Alp Takin was pretty beaten, so he quickly agreed that he would simply pay off um, Zemiskis if he would simply depart. But because the city was kind of beaten up due to the um, not long ago seizure of power by Alp Takin and then this latest battlefield defeat, they were not able to pay the indemnity very easily, so Zemiskis had to tarry for a while waiting for the money to be collected. Eventually he did get his money and then he left. His next move was to march to the coast where he besieged Beirut. There he installed a garrison after he took the city. And while he was besieging Beirut, he also received an embassy from Sidon, which simply surrendered and offered him money. He then marched south and stormed the city of Byblos, where we get the word Bible and also the Greek word Byblos, which gives us Spanish words like biblioteca, the root of things like book and library. Um, Zemiskis, however, then marched on to the city of Tripolis, which was held by a Fatimid garrison, and it was only here that his attempts to capture the city failed. After this, he marched back to Byzantine territory. By and large, a pretty successful campaign, even if there were no uh, world-shattering events during it. But if his plan was to break up um, this area of Syria and then annex it the way that Caldellus thinks that he was trying to do um, then in this case it was a successful opening campaign and undoubtedly had he persisted with the strategy he had a very good chance of actually taking Syria and adding it to the empire the way that his uncle had conquered Cilicia and annexed it. On his return journey from Syria, Zemiskis fell gravely ill with some kind of a respiratory ailment. 
When he arrived at the capital, he was barely breathing. The Byzantine sources blame poison, and they name the poisoner as Basil Lycopinus, the eunuch who ran the bureaucracy. Supposedly, Zemiskis was deeply disturbed to see how many prosperous frontier estates were owned by Basil Lycopinus, and he resolved to do something about it when he got back to Constantinople. This supposedly panicked the eunuch Basil, and he accordingly sent his agents to poison the emperor so that he would not be put on trial, publicly humiliated, and then deprived of his hard-won um, estates. We don't really know um, John Zemisky's uh, health record, and of course we also have a two and a half year gap in our knowledge of his activities, so it's possible that he had some pre-existing health concerns which were then aggravated by the strains of the campaign in Syria and then the return journey. Most likely Basil Lycopinus did not engage in this act because he would have had very little to gain by it. He had been entrusted with more power by Zemiskis than any previous emperor, and things were not likely to get much better for Basil. Also, if Basil did act in this way, most likely it would have been in order to liberate his nephews rather than to punish Zemiskis, who had always done well by him. We have to remember, as always, that our sources are deeply, deeply biased against eunuchs, so um, Anytime something happens, they will be blamed, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. What we do know is that John I Zemiskis died on January 10th or 11th of 976 at the age of 51. He accomplished quite a bit, and had he lived a few more years, he would have accomplished more. But here is where his story ends. The chapel that Zemiskis was buried at has not survived. However, we know where it was located, and we do have a pretty good idea of what the nearby local landmark would have looked like. Zemiskis took a small chapel near the Chalky Gate, which had originally been built by Romanus I as a kind of private prayer area for the emperor, and then enhanced it, always intending for this to be his burial place. It's interesting to contrast the personalities of Romanus and Zemiskis. Romanus, this highly neurotic uh, and very religious guy who just wanted a private place to retreat to away from the public eye where he could weep over his sins, as compared with Zemiskis, who, while he had his uncle's blood on his hands, seems to have not really experienced too much guilt over it and just wanted a really nice and unique burial place. This was a site that he selected by 972 at the latest, it was already under construction by the time that he set out on his Bulgarian campaign, and it was also the last place he stopped before he left the city that year. Interesting side fact. This would be his ultimate burial place. This is what the Chalky Gate most likely looked like during its prime, so around the time that Zemisky selected this as the site of his burial, this would have been what you would have seen outside of the tomb. Let's consider the legacy of John I Zemiskis. The first thing we have to mention is that he has heavy source bias in his favor, and this is somewhat of a problem for trying to assess him fairly. The portrait that we get is almost overwhelmingly positive to the point where we have to wonder what he did wrong. Certainly he must have done something wrong, and we just don't get a real portrait of that from the sources. I mean, unless you count the obvious assassination of Nicephorus. Zemiskis knew Leo the Deacon personally. The two of them seemed to have been friends, and even if they were not quite as close as we think they were, the fact is that Zemiskis could read what Leo wrote, so Leo had to be rather careful in his comments. Constantine Manasses was an admirer from a later period. He wrote under the aegis of Manuel I Comnenus, and he was a total Zemiskis fanboy. In general, the sources paint a rather rosy portrait, so we have to consider whether this was more or less accurate or whether it overrates the abilities and accomplishments of Zemiskis. I really don't know whether they were accurate or whether they were being too kind to the man. It's very hard to tell. And that is largely because of those gaps I mentioned where we don't know what he did under Romanus II 
And we also don't have a very clear clue about what he was up to for the two and a half or so years between late 972 and the summer of 975. What we can say based on the available evidence is that Zemiskis had the total package required to become a truly great emperor. He was a good general. Now, he was not the best general of his age. He was not on the same tactical level as someone like his uncles, Nicephorus and Leo Phocas, but he was certainly very competent and he won a number of major victories. He seems to have been better at major set-piece battles than he was at, say, ambush battles and using uh, terrain most effectively. That being said, um, you don't necessarily have to be the best general to be the best ruler. His other skills were actually more impressive. As we mentioned on several occasions, one thing that Zemiskis could do that his uncle Nicephorus never could was engage in diplomacy on an effective level. Zemiskis often used diplomacy to good effect. On several occasions, he managed to save himself a lot of headache by being an effective negotiator. He was also a great and natural politician. He was liked by the people around him. Clearly, that source bias that he had in his favor was because of his personality. He was able to win the approval of the people around him. This also means that he was good at becoming popular with the public. People did not miss Nicephorus after he was dead, which seems odd given that Nicephorus was a war hero, but they were happy enough to accept Zemiskis. He had grand ambitions for Byzantium, and unlike Nicephorus, who was always impatient and imposing, Zemisky seems to have understood pacing to some extent. He knew that it would take some time to consolidate what he had gained in Bulgaria, so he seems to have taken a somewhat relaxed approach to his eastern ambitions. Had he lived longer, the campaign he started in Syria in 975 may very well have borne fruit in the form of the Byzantine annexation of Syria as a whole. As it stands, however, his early death meant that this was not likely to happen. So back to the elephant in the room. His usurpation and bloody murder of his uncle Nicephorus and then his ambiguous intentions toward Basil and Constantine are definitely marks against him. Um, people today tend to be horrified by the murder he committed and by the idea that had Zemiskis had his way, most likely Basil II, the Bulgar Slayer, would have been in a Constantine VII situation while Zemisky served as a latter-day Romanus I Lycopinus. That being said, just like with Romanus, we should not let the usurpation and disloyalty cloud our judgment about his abilities. John Zemisky was a great emperor. He had all of the skills and talents one could ever hope for in a ruler, especially a ruler at this time, and he spent his entire life toward expanding and improving the empire as a whole. Given how Basil took some time to really get going as emperor, I think it's not unreasonable to speculate that had Zemiskis lived a few years longer and allowed Basil to mature just a few more years, that this would have been a more ideal um, situation for the empire than having Basil come to the throne when he did, when he still needed to be more refined in order to really rule effectively. But we'll get to that when we get to that. For now, we're only talking about John Zemiskis, and I conclude that he was a great emperor, and he would have been one of the greatest had he just lived, say, five more years. Until next time, when we discuss the person who I get requests about all the time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and I will see you around.